you for joining us for the final webinar of the four-part series, Exploring Topics in Periosystemic Health. Sponsored by Sunstar, this series is offered expressly for you as members of the next DDS. My name is Sarah Alspaugh, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to your speaker, Dr. Greg Kurtzman. Greg has published over 550 articles in dental journals around the world, and he has lectured internationally on topics ranging from periodontics to implant dentistry. Dr. Kurtzman is going to get underway in just a few minutes, but first let's cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar will run approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and you can pose your questions for Dr. Kurtzman at any time using the chat tool at the bottom of your screen. We'll collect them and address as many as possible after the presentation. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to send me a private message using the chat tool, and I'll assist you as soon as possible. Okay, so without any further business to handle, let's begin. Welcome, Dr. Kurtzman. You now have the floor. Good evening, everybody, and I hope uh, you guys had a great Thanksgiving and didn't eat too much turkey. Uh, we're going to conclude this uh, four-part series on oral biofilm and systemic connection, basically pulling in the other three parts where we've talked about what the biofilm does, and basically we're going to say, all right, now that we know what it does to the body, how do we actually treat this and put it into clinical use? A little bit about me. Uh, I've been... Uh, very eager and uh, enthusiastic in education, um, and I enjoy publishing and sharing knowledge. Uh, we'll go from there. So part one, we basically talked about oral biofilm inflammation and the oral uh, health uh, connection. Uh, part two, we talked about some, some systemic effects uh, due to these oral biofilms, including cardiac issues, kidney, pulmonary, diabetes, colon, and uh, oral cancer. Part three, which was the last part, we did more systemic effects, and we talked about prostate, pancreatitis, uh, liver, pain, pregnancy, fertility, Alzheimer's, and artificial joints. And as we said, we're going to roll this all together and say, now that we have the knowledge of what it does, how do we actually treat this and uh, bring it into clinical use? So we're basically our agenda is going to be, we're going to talk about patient immune response. We're going to go into biofilm disturbance, uh, how to treat this with peroxides and why. Uh, talk about antibiotics as an anti-inflammatory agent talk a little bit about laser treatment, and then some special considerations and treatment. So the systemic connection, harmful bacteria strains in the oral biofilm can enter the bloodstream and they get an inflammatory response that travels to other areas of the body. So what happens in the mouth is not really locked only into the mouth, it has effects throughout the entire system. And this exerts a distant systemic effect that has been linked to numerous diseases including, including cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, diabetes, and many others, as we discussed in part two of the series. And evidence indicates that patients with periodontal disease have a much higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease and other systemic issues than those who have preventative measures to control the biofilm in the mouth. Managing and maintaining the periodontal environment can have general health benefits, preventing systemic issues, and decreasing the severity of the systemic issues already present. So let's look at the patient immune response. We discussed in part one, quorum sensing the immune response, where bacteria in the biofilm have the ability to regulate numerous processes through what is termed quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is a cell-to-cell -cell communication mechanism that synchronizes gene expression in the biofilm in relation to the density of the cell population. This includes uh, secreting specific enzymes to activate or deactivate the genes of other bacteria. So how bacteria act when they're alone is different than in the biofilm. And when we're talking alone, we're talking about planktonic, which is on surfaces. Biofilm is basically in a sticky matrix, and they basically work in conjunction, as we say, turning on and off genes to benefit the colony. These bacterial byproducts provoke immune response from the host, which recruits white blood cells to the site to kill the invading bacteria. This results in uh, localized inflammation in the surrounding gingiva, we, what we equate as periodontal disease and gingivitis. Via quorum sensing, the bacteria have the ability to confuse the defending white blood cells chemotactically by releasing chemicals into the local environment, rendering the immune response ineffective. White blood cells have a three-day life cycle, and if they do not engulf a bacterium and destroy within that time frame, those cells lice and die. 
and components within the white blood cells that are intended to kill the bacteria are now available to damage the tissue they were meant to protect, contributing to bone loss, deepening of periodontal pockets, and more inflammation. So how do we manage uh, pathogenic bacteria? Uh, these microbial uh, bacteria and biofilms are less susceptible to antimicrobial agents, either locally applied or systemically administered. These microbial uh, communities can display enhanced pathogenicity through synergism, and the structure of the biofilm may re uh, restrict penetration of antimicrobial agents, while bacteria growing on a surface are susceptible to uh, antimicrobial agents. In other words, when it's on a surface, antibiotics and other things can basically destroy those bacteria, but when you put them in that sticky matrix in the biofilm, they're fairly resistant to this. So aggregated bacteria work together as a community, producing specific proteins and enzymes by way of quorum sensing, utilizing oral fluids as a vector of transmission. Bacteria in this oral environment have evolved as part of a multi-species biofilm and may require interaction with other bacterial species to grow, forming complex bioenvironments. Also, rated gums, antibiotics have conditioned us that localized inflammatory responses prompted by a bacterial infection should be treated with antibiotics. But with biofilms, antibiotics are very limited in their effectiveness. Localized antibiotics, uh, where they may be appropriate for acute short-term treatment of bacteria that are actively dividing, biofilms have defense strategies. They have a slime layer that's difficult for antibacterial uh, bacterial to uh, penetrate. And layers are dormant, so even if you identify an antibiotic that works, which is difficult to do, almost impossible to culture biofilms they do as you do planktonic bacteria, these antibiotics only work well against the outer layers that are actively dividing. Uh, communicative uh, resistance, chemical quorum sensing, a physical exchange of genetic materials to communication between species, so resistance of the antibiotics can be sh uh, shared via intra and inter species. Bacteria growing in biofilms can become up to 1,000 times more resistant to antibiotics and biocides as compared to their planktonic counterparts. As a result, biofilms and biofilm-related infections cannot be effectively treated with conventional antibiotic therapy. Treatment is even more complicated by the diversity of the biofilm communities. Biofilm from the same mouth uh, as uh, we see in the previous slide indicating the profound difference in bacteria communities adjacent to each other. And we can see these two uh, slides here. These are adjacent pockets of two different teeth in the same patient, and we can see different bacteria in those. So from pocket to pocket, the biofilms are gonna be different. The antibiotics are not gonna work on these uh, various uh, things from pocket to pocket. So they're really ineffective. Also, we have the problem with systemic antibiotics. We have allergies, we have resistance. We have identifying appropriate drugs for the biofilm diversity. We have side effects from those antibiotics. And systemic antibiotics share many of the same challenges as localized with the added unpleasant side effects. And that was talked about in January of uh, 2013 in the New York Times, when pills fail, this uh, option is uh, not a cure. So antibiotic resistance, we have seven antibiotic resistant threats. We have Clostridium difficile, we have uh, other bacteria that are listed out here. And these basically, sometimes when we knock one bacteria down, these things basically uh, uh, spring up and cause problems. In fact, I had a patient in today who has an infection and she said, look, you know, every time I take an antibiotic, I have another problem. So we have to put her on a different medicine to counteract the effects of the antibiotics so we can get her dental uh, infection under control. So antibiotics are not always the answer and they do have problems in themselves. So let's talk about biofilm disturbance. Cleaning only removes about 50% of the initial biofilm, and we get regrowth fourfold increase in about three hours. Second cleaning removes about 75% of the new colonization, and second regrowth is threefold increase in three hours. So how long does it take for a mature biofilm on the tooth surface in a pair of pocket? 48 hours. So you get a patient in, you do a nice cleaning, you can even do scaling a root planing, you get everything out of there. Within 48 hours, that biofilm is building back up, no matter how good the patient is at home care. 
So here it is. Let's look at home care. Toothbrushing. Under the best scenario, a toothbrush bristle can only reach about three to four millimeters into the pocket. Manual electric is the same thing. So if most of our patients are having pockets that are deeper than four millimeters, so in those areas, you cannot reach it with a uh, toothbrush. Dental floss is not, even, uh, not any better. It's good for cleaning it approximately, but very ineffective on the buccal lingual surfaces of the tooth in the sulcus. Uh, so it can't get to the depth of the pocket. Oral irrigators are just as bad. They're effective at de de debris removal, super gingerly and approximately, but they're not effective deeper than three to four millimeters in the pocket, just like uh, toothbrushes. Succular environment is difficult for most patients to reach with brushing and flossing, making it impossible to control oral biofilms by mechanical means alone as the bacteria grows and replicates so rapidly. As we said, toothbrushes are, are poorly effective at greater than four millimeters subgingivally. Oral irrigators similarly cannot reach the bottom of the pocket, so most patients are not diligent in the use uh, daily. Uh, regrowth of the biofilm occurs within three hours of debridement, resulting in a 400% increase in biofilm mass. So in a sense, we stimulate the biofilm and it just over reproduces. Post-cleaning biofilm redevelopment is more rapid and complex, exceeding pre-cleaning levels within two days. Bacteria embedded in the biofilm are up to 1,000 fold more resistant to antibiotics, as we said, compared to plain tonic. These antibiotics either systemically or oral rinses and site application are unable to eliminate or manage the biofilm uh, bacteria adequately. And this has implications with natural teeth, dental implants, uh, leading to peri-implantitis. Chlorhexidine is effective young, uh, on young biofilms, but the bacteria mature biofilms and nutrient-limited biofilms have been shown to be very resistant to its effects. Although hydrogen peroxide has been documented as an effective means of both eliminating the biofilm as well as preventing its reformation. Hydrogen peroxide has been documented used daily for up to six years with no adverse effects or carcinogenic activity, while showing a decrease in biofilm, uh, enhanced wound healing, and improved gingival bleeding. Uh, no allergic reactions have been reported and bacterial strains demonstrate no resistance to it. Functionally, it debrides the biofilm slime matrix and bacterial cell wall. What you have to do is you have to think of a biofilm almost like an onion. What the peroxide does is it peels layer by layer off, exposing deeper layers, breaking it down. Published studies have documented the ideal concentration for hydrogen peroxide is 1.7% to break down the biofilm without causing irritation. A 10-minute exposure to 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel penetrates the biofilm slime matrix, debriding the cell, uh, bacterial cell walls within, maintaining the peroxide and periodontal pocket releases oxygen, and changes the subgingival uh, microfilm environment, making survival of the anaerobic bacteria more difficult. So what we're doing is we're changing the environment, and most of the time, bad environments are anaerobic. So if we convert that to an aerobic environment, it basically is healthier for the system. To be effective, peroxide application has to be part of the daily home care routine. Requirements for any approach is that it has to be easy to use. If we want patient compliance, it's got to be able to reach the depths of the pockets. It has to be effective in breaking down the biofilm while preventing it from rebuilding when used daily. The problem is delivering hydrogen peroxide to the depth of the pocket and keeping it there to assert its actions in the biofilm for the effective time required. Fluid produced in the sulcus is a natural process. The flush bacteria and other items from the pocket also flushes any materials added by the dental professional. So normal sulcular fluid is replaced 40 times an hour, making spontaneous inflow of a pocket virtually impossible. And in flame tissue, this may increase up to 30 times normal flow. So what we need to do is we have to make something that is easy for the patient to comply with, because if it's too difficult, people just don't do it. And we have to basically be able to hold something in the pocket to overcome the sulcular fluid flow so that it can assert its actions. This constant outflow of uh, crevicular fluid leads to an extremely fast clearance of any topically applied product in the pocket. Since the peroxide gel requires sufficient contact time, placing it into the pocket with an irrigation syringe is ineffective and would be time consuming for the patient, which means that they're not gonna comply. If you give a syringe to a patient and say, you gotta squirt this around all your pockets, the patient's not gonna do it. 
it's going to be too time consuming. It's going to they'll do it for a night or two, and then by the second week, they're not doing it at all. So customized trays have been successfully utilized and designed to deliver solutions for hydrogen peroxide, as an example, deep in the periodontal pockets against the force of this corbicular fluid flow. If the tray is worn for 15 minutes, uh, the peroxide is shown to reach the bottom of pockets that are greater than seven millimeters. I guess we have some questions coming up. While we're waiting for that, the key basically is really it's 10 minutes, uh, but I tell patients 15 because if you tell them 15, 10 minutes, they're doing it for eight, seven or eight minutes. So we want to make sure it's in there for at least 10 minutes. So we have this first question here, if everybody wants to answer that. Now we'll leave this open just for a few more moments to let our attendees share some of their feedback. Thanks everyone for your candor. All right, going to leave it open for just another few seconds so that Dr. Kurtzman can resume his conversation with you all. All right, it's coming right up. About 15 more seconds, get those last answers in. Predominantly on the true. There we go, quick display of those results for everyone. Perfect. All right, Dr. Kurtzman, turning the reins back over to you. Thank you. So let's talk about more about peroxides. And you know, it's interesting because it's really an ideal material because it oxygenates everything. Uh, it breaks it down. There's no resistance from the bacteria. Um, so it's really an ideal material. It's antiseptic, uh, oral debriding agent, oral wound cleansing. Uh, typically, what we get in the store uh, is a 3% solution. So let's talk about the history of rinses and paste. You know, there's a lot of products on the market that have peroxide in it. It's a commonplace ingredient. And a lot of dental products primarily as a whitening agent, but also as an antiseptic and antimicrobial agent. And the low concentrations has a very well-documented safety record. So we see it in a lot of mouth rinses, we see it in toothpaste. But we're gonna talk about a specific one, which is Perio Gel, which is a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. Uh, no allergic reactions, uh, bacterial strains, as we said, are not resistant to this 1.7% gel. Uh, it debris the oral biofilm uh, slime matrix, breaks down uh, bacterial cell walls, oxygenates the pocket. The concentration is kept purposely low so that it does not cause sensitivities that occur with higher peroxide solutions. Humans are not allergic to hydrogen peroxide. It's in our saliva, liver, breast milk, and white blood cells. The interesting thing is that we all produce uh, uh, peroxidases, which break down natural peroxides. Um, if some people that, you know, if you have patients that say, well, I've used a uh, peroxide mouth rinse uh, and I get a little irritation after a while, it's because usually what's happened is they don't produce a lot of peroxidase. So what happens is they don't break it down to get a little irritation. We see no irritation at the 1.7% level. Used daily up to six years, it's been documented. No carcinogenic activity or adverse effects. Decreased plaque and gingival indices. Wound healing was enhanced. The problem, therapeutic delivery of hydrogen peroxide to prevent periodontal disease required mechanical access to the subgingival pockets. As we've talked about, we have to get that down to the bottom of the pocket and hold it there for a set amount of time if it's gonna be effective. We talked about corvicular flow, toothbrushes, floss, and oral uh, rinses have limited access in the pockets. Even though the patient could place medicaments in the pocket, it doesn't remain in the pocket long. Corvicular flow uh, cleans out the pocket area 40 times an hour under healthy conditions. 
And when this area becomes infected with uh, the corvicular flow increases, and it could be up to 30 times greater than normal to help flush out what's ever in there that's causing the problem. Unfortunately, the bacterial biofilm is attached to the tooth, so it is not easily flushed out, and the bacteria, uh, the infection uh, from this bacteria maintains or gets worse. And medications that are placed into the uh, gingival sulcus without using the perio tray, and we'll talk about that, may be diluted uh, by curricular flow and limit the efficiency of that over time. So we're going to talk about a, uh, basically a special tray that's designed to hold us in uh, and to the uh, depth of the pockets. And the tray overcomes the curricular flow, retaining the medicament in the pocket to render its effect. And that's what the, uh, basically the Perio Protect trays look like. Uh, what happens is, and we'll talk about this in a little more depth in a, uh, shortly, the patient wears this, and it depends on how severe the condition is. We may start, if they're having a lot of bleeding and other issues, or maybe some uh, exudate in those pockets, after we cleaned everything, we may have them wear this three or four times a day for 15 minutes at a time. We get to a certain point where everything looks healthy, they're not getting more bleeding, and then we basically move to them using it just once a day uh, for 15 minutes. And I usually tell patients with this, the best way to do this is you get up in the morning, you put it in the tray, and you get in the shower. Then when you're done, you know, you're in the shower for at least 15 minutes doing stuff. Or you can basically pop it in, you drive to work, you get to work, you rinse your mouth out, and you do the same thing on the way home uh, in the car. So that basically eats it up uh, the time you have to do it during the day. So it makes it very easy for the patient to comply. Periotray is FDA cleared. It's a, a prescription medical device. So that basically it has to be dispensed by the, uh, uh, the dentist. Uh, what you do is you take a, an impression and you uh, deliver this. Uh, you send it off to the lab and they make this. It's very flexible, it's comfortable, it's non-invasive delivery. Uh, the perio tray differs from other trays of mouth guards in that it's flexible materials custom formed with specialist seals and extensions for the shape and depth of those pockets. So what you have to do is you have to send them a perio charting with the impressions so they know how deep those pockets are so they can make that seal to make sure they're holding the medicament in those areas. Uh, which are going to be different in the mouth. You may have a seven millimeter pocket one place, a four millimeter in the other, so they have to design it specifically for that. And it's Perio Protect is registered U.S. government provider for uh, Perio trays. And that's what it looks like when the patient's wearing. So why are these trays so special? Basically, they need a lab that uh, has models and a copy of the periodontal exam. We uh, said that it has to be a very accurate, detailed uh, impression. Uh, with pockets over three millimeters, and along with bleeding index exam, that will create a seal-like gasket and extension around each tooth using the information from the periodontal exam. The seal fits precisely against the gingiva, holding the material in there to fight that curricular fluid flow. The tray holds the medicament of the thing around the uh, gum tissue. It's important because it turns out not only do we have to get the proxy into the pocket, we have to keep it there long enough to work. And as we said, it basically has to be in there for about 10 minutes. But I always tell patients, I want you to wear this for 15 minutes. And as I said, the reason is if you tell them 10 minutes, people just by nature do something seven or eight minutes. If you tell them 15 minutes, they're going to do at least 10 minutes, hopefully 12, 13, 14 minutes. But we know that it's in contact for 10 minutes, which is needed. So we basically look at these. Let's look at the effect of the 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. We look on the left, that's uncontrolled. We have basically the red is signifying uh, uh, very active, and the black basically is dead bacteria. So if we look on the uh, right side, after three days, uh, S. mutants in the biofilm treated for five minutes with a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel, we can see a lot of that bacteria has been killed already. Here we look at the left picture, we see that it's treated for 10 minutes, uh, we're seeing a lot more kill. So if we treat it with a placebo that has no hydrogen peroxide in it, so we're saying, all right, maybe it's a placebo effect, we're putting something there, holding it under pressure, we can see there's a lot of active uh, bacteria still there. So let's look at some cases. Here's a patient basically who has, uh, the red is indicating uh, bleeding areas. So we have a lot of bleeding. We have some uh, significant pocketing. And this is prior to treatment. So how do we know the Perio, uh, tra uh, perio Protect trays work? 
uh, USC Center for Biofilm, the traceable medicament in the pocket and around the gum tissue. This is important because it turns out not only do they have to get the peroxide in the pocket, as we said, you have to keep it there long enough, and we can see those pockets on that x-ray, that's some significant perio bone loss. So basically, they looked at one patient, uh, patient one here, uh, male, uh, type 2 periodontal disease, before perio treatment, 19, uh, 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 site 19. We have a probing depth of 5 millimeters. Uh, we can see what's in that pocket. Two days of perio protect uh, spray with the hydrogen peroxide gel. Microbial reduction, 0%. So after two days treatment of percentage of coccyte-like bacteria and, uh, had dramatically increased at the expense of rod-shaped uh, uh, bacteria, mostly anaerobic. So basically we keep looking at here and we see that uh, we're seeing more and more effect on this. We get a reduction uh, using the peroxide gel here of 99%. After two days of treatment, evaluation shows significantly less areas of biofilm. So it's breaking it down, peeling those layers of the onion away. So we get tetracycline crystals at the carrier apex. Basically, they had uh, studied this to see what is going on down at the bottom of the pocket. So if we look here, the uh, red is the control group, and the blue line is the perioprotect group. And we can see that there is a reduction over time compared to the control group. And that's wearing a, basically a tray with nothing in it or a gel that has no peroxide in it, just to get rid of that placebo effect. We can see here uh, pocket probing depth changes over time. We sort of see a dramatic change uh, with the perioprotect uh, trace and the peroxide. And this is, you know, at 13 weeks. Uh, if we basically stop using this, we're going to basically start seeing an increase, as you see here, over a period of time. So hydrogen peroxide and depth of the pocket, you know, really gets down into those depths of the pocket, no matter how deep it is, and it can get rid of the biofilm and allows the body to heal itself in a sense, once you get rid of the offending uh, bacteria. So let's, you know, talk a little about antibiotics as an anti-inflammatory. And the interesting thing is that if we look at antibiotics, we always think that they're really there to kill bacteria, but they do have other properties at lower doses. So we basically would talk about hydrogen peroxide, what, what about antibiotics? In times when an antibiotic is prescribed, not for an, its antibacterial properties, but for its anti-inflammatory properties. And what we're using basically is vibromycin, which is a doxycycline that comes 50 milligrams per five milliliters. And what we're doing is we're supplementing this in the tray with the hydrogen peroxide. We're only doing it in refractory cases where we have a lot of heavy bleeding or exudate. And we're doing it for a short period of time to get that under control, then the peroxide alone will handle everything. So it basically inhibits osteoclasts and boosts osteoblasts. So what it's going to do is it's going to prevent bone breakdown, but it's going to boost bone buildup. So we get those very, like I said, refractive cases. We may want to supplement this in uh, using this also for a short period of time. So here it is, basically, we'll look at this one study that was done. We have periogel and vibromycin in the uh, group one. And then we have uh, group two is periogel only. And then group three is debridement and scaling at week three. So we can basically see what uh, group one had the best results. And it was pretty close with group two. But when we have a, uh, compared to the control group, we see that there's basically uh, much uh, more significant results with the periogel and vibromycin or the periogel alone. That doesn't mean we're not scaling a root planning. We're using this as a supplemental uh, treatment, something to maintain and get that down. So when we're doing this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, give the patients a prescription and request that they go fill this for vibromycin syrup, 50 milligrams per five milliliters, dispense one to two ounces, and they're gonna apply three drops into the perio tray uh, per treatment and even we distribute that, and we'll show you what that looks like with the, uh, the gel. So what we do is we put a line of uh, the peroxide gel in there. We put three drops, one in each posterior quad and one in the anterior, and then we use something, a Q-tip or something, to sort of stir it up and distribute it in that perio uh, gel, and then we uh, have them wear that. So we're going to basically do that for uh, when we have generalized bleeding or it's just not responding 
to uh, treatment as well as we'd like it to. So the contraindications uh, to this are if they have an allergic to tetracyclines, they're pregnant or nursing patients uh, and children, uh, may enhance effects of anticoagulants leading to prolonged bleeding or bruising for patients on warfarin drugs, and long-term use can lead to superficial staining on exposed root surfaces. One thing we do want to point out to the patient is that when they're using the vibromycin uh, uh, syrup in there, they're going to see, and you're only using it for about two to six weeks, we're going to see loss of stippling uh, on the gingiva. Uh, which will come back once they stop uh, using the fibromycin. Uh, basically, it, it has an effect on the collagenase uh, produced during the inflammatory process, and that basically leads to loss of stippling. And if we look at the picture on the left, we can see there's no stippling in the gingiva, and the picture on the right is normally what we would normally see with stippling. So basically, it's really for short-term use, like we said, two to six weeks. And if we look at some of these uh, examples, uh, on the uh, before column there, we see bleeding. Uh, on the after column, we see that it's disappeared using that uh, in combination with the peroxide gel in the tray. So they're basically prescription trays for maintenance patients. Uh, we look at this picture, here's pre-treatment versus post-treatments, and we can see as the ginger looks healthier, it's not bleeding. We've gotten some tissue shrinkage there. Uh, so basically, we're going to get him in, we're going to examine him, we're going to diagnose the perio issue, we're going to talk about maintenance scaling, uh, take an impression, uh, we're going to send that off with the uh, uh, perio charting, and then we're going to have them, the patient start using this. Uh, usually the best thing to do, because there is a two-week turnaround to get the trays, we'll get him in, diagnose them, we'll do a gross debridement, take the impression at that point, send that out, and then we get them back to scale and root and usually by the time we get to the second, because uh, we'll get them in one week, do two quads, we get them in the following, we can do the second two quads. And at a point, we usually have the trays to start them on how to use them. And I like to get them usually back like uh, between two and four weeks later after they've been using the trays and everything, just to check everything, make sure that it fits, it's comfortable, they're using it, and also uh, reinforce, hey, we're not seeing any bleeding anymore, the gums don't look as puffy, you have to reinforce these things so the patient sees that there is a benefit and gives them a reason why they need to continue this. And it's interesting that one of the patients will show, uh, it was interesting because we got him, to, he had had perio treatments by people, we got him in the trays, and you know, he, he was getting a great result. And he comes in one day and he says, well, I'm using it twice a day. It's like, you know, should I stop it at some point? I said, well, I'd really like you to stay on maintenance. Why don't we cut it to once a day? They said, you know, I'm getting such great results twice a day, but gums don't bleed anymore. Uh, is it a problem if I use it twice a day? I said, no, that's great. I was figured I'd have to twist his arm to use it once a day because he's not a real compliant patient. So let's look at some case examples. Patient right here, 30%, 39% uh, bleeding on probing. We can see that pretty much they're bleeding everywhere. Uh, moderate recession and bone loss. Uh, had a full mouth of breathement and scaling and root planing and impressions for perio, uh, the perio trace was taken and uh, instructions to use it twice a day for 10 minutes. So here it is before and after. Uh, and this is basically using it with some vibromycin gel. We can see we've drastically changed, and this was the scaling and root planing, then the trays. We've drastically changed, so we just have a few isolated pockets uh, on the right image showing where, and those are really at the deepest uh, uh, probings, we see basically uh, some uh, bleeding and probing there. So we may want to go in and maybe laser treat this, scale it a little bit more, have them continue with the trays, and then we may see that uh, resolve on its own and be able to maintain that. So here it is perio maintenance. Um, they're using it one time a day, not real compliant. So we can see that the, these pockets are starting to bleed more. So we're seeing it building back up. So the key really is compliance on this. 40 months post uh, start of any treatment, we went from on the left, pretty much bleeding in every pocket there. We've reduced the pockets, so we can see there's a great reduction and there's no bleeding anywhere in the mouth on probing. So we can see that when we use this, we are getting results and it's maintainable. 
So basically, here's a, a case, you know, patient comes in, we all see this, a lot of uh, calculus, a lot of subgingival, supergingival, gums are very puffy, you just look at them and they start bleeding. Uh, this patient here is 100% bleeding on probing, 74% uh, or four to seven millimeter pockets throughout the mouth. The patient is heavy bleeding and severely swollen gingiva. We deliver the trays before doing anything, let them start wearing it for about two to three weeks, and then we get them back. So what happens is we're using the uh, uh, vibromycin with this. This basically in the bottom picture is with before any scaling and uh, root planing is done. So we see we're getting some resolution in the gingiva. Now we can go in and now we can scale on root plane and we can get that stuff. The benefit also of the peroxide is it softens the calculus that's there. So it's easier to remove it once we go in and scale on root plane. Do we do this all the time? No, but when we get those patients that are really, really covered in uh, tartar where you can barely even see the uh, teeth, this may be an option to do this beforehand so that it's actually more comfortable for the patient. We get the ginger healthier before we get in there and start scaling the root plane. Treatment six months, no surgery. And we can see in the bottom picture after scaling the root planing, uh, everything is resolved and we have a nice healthy gingiva there. It looks healthy. It's pink, it's not inflamed, there's no calculus present. And we basically have the patient keep uh, using the tray. But at this point, we're only using the peroxide gel in it. We basically have to, as we said, after two to six weeks, we discontinued having them use the vibromycin in the trays. So who's the candidate for use of these things? Maintenance cases, refractory cases, generalized bleeding, dentally anxious or fearful, patients who are avoiding having stuff done. We may want to start those patients beforehand on this, on the trays before we go in the scale on plane. And those patients with systemic concerns with bacteremias. So why opt for the perio tray in the first place? Here's a case by uh, Dr. Hobbs in Augusta, Georgia. This is how the patient comes in. We can see a lot of inflammation, a lot of subgingival calculus. And here it is basically just using the trays for two weeks before any mechanical scaling or root planing. We can see we've gotten a lot of resolution in the uh, gingiva. There are a lot of the calculus has broken down and come up there. So now we can go in, it's easier on the patient, it's easier on us to go in and mechanically remove what's uh, remaining there. This is a, you know, interesting case that a friend of mine, Dr. Greg Sawyer out in California had, uh, had a patient, he placed an implant in August of 2007, restored this and patient comes in in 2009, two years later, and we can see some significant bone loss on this. No mobility, uh, but there's definitely bone loss on the radiograph. Uh, it's solid, so we're not gonna remove it. If an implant's loose, then we remove it, but this is solid. So what he tried to do is, he said, let's treat it with a perio protect. Let's see what happens, and then we can go from there. His plan was to probably have to bone graft this. So here it is, uh, same implant in 2012 on the right, no bone grafting, just a perio protect and cleaning it. And we could see actually we built bone back up on this. So this at this point is maintainable that he does not have to go in and do some bone grafting. But if we compare the left picture to the right one where that bone loss was, we have bone loss on the distal pretty much halfway down the implant. It's not there on the, uh, uh, after using this for a couple of years with the perio protect trace. And it's maintainable and it's easy for uh, the patient to use. So uh, there are sometimes we get incomplete tissue response, and this may be non-compliance or leaking seal. Uh, the occlusion might be an issue, uh, cracked tooth, endoperio lesions, uh, subgingival calculus, uh, pathogen invasion. The key basically also is if it's not working, you have to start suspect in an isolated area, start suspecting something else may be the cause. If we have a deep pocket and it's not resolving, we may start suspecting it's an endoperio lesion, it may be a vertical root fracture, it may be uh, occlusal trauma. We start looking at other things as to why. And the big one is, I always ask the patient, are you wearing the trays? Because, you know, it's just like bleaching. We used to do a lot of tray bleaching, and you send the patients home the first week they use it, and by the second or third week, they're not really using it anymore. And then they come in after four months, and they go, you know, I didn't get a really good result. I wasn't really happy. And I, okay, how often will you? Or use it the first week. Like, well, you have to. You had to use it for a period of time, and they just 
they get non-compliant, and then they, it's the fault of the appliance. It's not their fault because they didn't use it. So basically, you know, we have other uh, things we can do surgical to remove stuff. We can use laser intervention if we have to. We can alter the host response in these, uh, these, in these manners. So let's look at laser treatment. And I think lasers are becoming a very common part of uh, dental treatment. And what we basically do with this is we're getting a lot of healing, better healing when we're using lasers, especially in these deep pocket situations. So what we'll do is in A, we're going in there with the laser before we do scaling or replanning. We've numbed the patient up. We go in and we're removing the inflamed inner circular lining so we can actually access to that calculus better. And then B, we go in and mechanically remove it with uh, ultrasonics and piezos and other means. And then we basically, once we're done with that, we go back in with the laser and we basically clean that out and sterilize the pocket and it stimulates healing in the soft tissue. So here, let's look at this one case. Patient comes in, uh, and this is the patient I mentioned who is, uh, said, you know, I, I'll use it twice a day because, and he was very non-compliant prior to coming into my care, and he admitted it. And here it is, we have, you know, not a lot of really, uh, a lot of real significant depths. We have a little bit on the lower, uh, but we have bleeding in every pocket. Uh, we have 100% bleeding on probing. So here it is, we scale and root plane, and we use the laser, and we have, we've narrowed it down, so now we have isolated uh, 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 depth of uh, pockets, and we have basically much less bleeding on probing. So we basically put him on, uh, we clean it out uh, with the laser again, and we get it to the point where there's no bleeding and everything. We've had him on the perio protect rays, and basically we're able to maintain this. And this is a comparison. When he came in on uh, March 11th of 2015, we can see the red line where it is. Uh, after all that treatment, uh, and starting on the periprotect rays on April 8th, we can see that we've reduced stuff. And the blue line basically is from June 3rd of the same year. We basically see that we've really changed the environment quite a bit. So now he's able to maintain it. We've got rid of a lot of those deep pockets and stuff. And it's really the, I think, the combination of using the laser and using the perio protect rays. And he continues to use this uh, one to two times a day for 15 minutes. One of the side effects that you, uh, and patients don't complain about this, is you do sometimes get a little bit of whitening of the teeth, not as drastically as you would if you did a uh, bleaching uh, uh, treatment, but you're going to get some. And if that patient's a coffee or tea drinker, it actually helps keep those stains down a bit. Cost range is really in the uh, U.S. is about $500 to $1,200 for the set of trays. National average is about $700. Uh, you take an impression, uh, your lab fee is going to be somewhere between $84 and $97. Uh, delivery appointment and a follow-up appointment. What I, and there is a code for this under the ADA, and that's uh, code 5994. The one thing I do tell patients when they have really deep pockets and a lot of inflammation is, we're going to probably have to replace those trays once you get a lot of shrinkage and resolution because now that seal is not really working as well. And the way they know you know that the seal is not working is you put the gel in, you put the tray in, and you see it sort of bubbling out of the edges of the tray. That means the seal is no longer good. And we need to now take a new impression, new perio charting, and send that out and have them make new trays. So basically the code from the ADA, which is 5994, is per arch. Uh, they give about 50% coverage. Uh, it's lab processed and it's a medicament carrier. So, what we're going to have to do is if we're doing a full mouth, we're using 5994 for the maxillary arch and 5994 for the mandibular arch. So, what we would do basically is say we're charging $700, let's say, 350 charge for the maxillary arch, 350 charge for the mandibular arch. One thing what I'll do usually is some people would dispense the gel in their office. That's an option. I usually write a prescription. They have to get this from a formulary. So what they do is they mail that or fax it over to the formulary, and they put down they'll, what they'll do is they'll then ship them to it. So I'll write down on the thing. They could have refills so for up to a year. Uh, so what will happen is usually I tell them uh, one tube will last you about, if you're doing it twice a day, a tube will last you about a month. So you want to order six tubes. Take five of them in the refrigerator so they'll last longer. 
uh, and when you're getting down to the, your last tube, then order another six tubes. If you're doing it more often, you may need to, or if you're doing it three or four times a day, you may need to order more tubes than that. And it costs uh, uh, it's usually about 16 to 20 dollars per tube. So I think it's an inexpensive uh, uh, maintenance thing for the patients. So some special uh, considerations, geriatric patients, uh, their medical compromise, decreased manual dexterity, increase in xerostomia due to natural decrease in salivary flow, uh, affects many of their medications, uh, increased potential for recurrent uh, decay and root caries. Dirty dentures are a big source of this. Uh, dentures can harbor biofilm on the surface. Uh, most patients are really not doing a great job cleaning their dentures as we see when they come into the office. And this may lead to aspiration of the biofilm and this potential cause of aspiration pneumonia in senior patients. With increasing age, the percentage of aspiration-related pneumonia uh, rapidly increases uh, compared to non-aspiration uh, pneumonias, as we can see in that chart. And that basically on the uh, right-hand side is a uh, what the lungs look like in a chest X-ray that has pneumonia. So how do we care for this? Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're going to scrub the, uh, have the patient or their aides uh, scrub the denture with a denture brush under running water daily to remove any loose debris and biofilm, and then soak it basically in just undiluted 3% hydrogen peroxide for about 15 minutes. Uh, some people advocate using uh, bleach. The problem with that is it's going to change the color of the uh, pink base plate of your denture. It's going to whiten and pull the pigments out. Peroxide has no effect on that. Uh, so it's not going to do any damage to the uh, denture. The one thing we do have an issue with sometimes is soft, some soft liner materials will harden over time with any of these cleaning products. And that could even be just your, uh, your simple uh, home care stuff that they get at the grocery store for cleaning dentures, those tablets you drop in the water. So we want to avoid bleach, as we said, uh, in these situations, especially with soft liners. Uh, one thing I will say is if I have a patient uh, with these crays, that is having sensitivity, I, what I would do is I'll dispense to them fluoride gel, a neutral sodium fluoride gel, and I tell them that once a day I want them to put the uh, fluoride gel in there with no peroxide gel, wear that for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they uh, report that that cuts down on the, uh, uh, the, any sensitivity they're having. So let's just summarize by saying white blood cells have a three-day life cycle. If they don't engulf bacterium and destroy within that time frame, they lice and die contributing to bone loss. Uh, deepening the periodontal pockets and inflammation. Slime layer is difficult for antibiotics to penetrate, hence they are ineffective either systemically or locally delivered to manage the bacteria in the biofilm. Bacteria in the biofilm is a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics than planktonic bacteria, and bacteria can vary between adjacent pockets, making it difficult to control with antibiotics. Biofilms are reestablished to a greater degree in 48 hours following mechanical debridement. Home care uh, methods with toothbrushes, irrigators, and floss are ineffective, deeper than three to four millimeters in the pocket. The biggest problem with biofilm management is patient compliance. But we can't make it easy for them to do. Patients aren't going to consistently do it and do it long term. Peroxides break down biofilm with no patient allergy issues, no bacterial resistance. Breakdown of the biofilm slime matrix has been shown to be safe long term. Due to curricular flow, unless the peroxide is held in the pocket long enough, it is pushed out of the pocket and is ineffective. Tray use is the only effective means to retain the peroxide gel in the pocket for the needed time to be effective in uh, biofilm breakdown. And in refractive cases where we see continuing bleeding, use of vibromycin in the tray with the peroxide gel has been, uh, as an anti-inflammatory properties, can be used short term to stabilize the periodontal condition, as we said, two to six weeks. Aspiration pneumonia and incidence increases in patients' age and dentures are a good source of biofilm, and this needs to be addressed, especially in nursing home patients. And we'll turn it over for any questions at this point. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurtzman. We do have some questions here, and I want to invite everyone to type their questions into the chat tool at the bottom of your screen. The first question here, um, Besides trays, what preventative measures do you usually take for high-risk patients? Well, you know, I think that uh, higher-risk patients, and if it's, uh, they have medical issues, we may be seeing them more frequently. We may be seeing them every three months. 
And I usually would tell patients that have perio issues, we're going to see you every three months. If I see you're stable and everything looks good, we may stretch that out to six months. But some patients need to be seen more often. And I tell them, you really need to do better home care. And that may be, you know, recommending an electric toothbrush. There was a study done in Sweden uh, many years ago where they found out what's the uh, ideal amount of time brushing your teeth. That was five minutes. Nobody brushes their teeth in five minutes. So they found out, you know, what the average person is a minute and a half at best. So they said, what do we do to make it efficient, more efficient that minute and a half? And electric toothbrushes help. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, do you anticipate in the future some self-diagnostic technologies like quorum sensing or microbial testing in the patient's home? And where will those innovations come from? You know, it's interesting. I was at a uh, meeting uh, on, a lot on this topic, uh, I think it was two years ago, and they had somebody go on for an hour about, you know, testing on the bacteria and figuring these things out. And I raised my hand and I said, all right, how does this change, knowing what bacteria is, how does it change my treatment? And the guy looked at me and he goes, oh, it doesn't. So I don't think, I think we're, we don't really need to know specifically what bacteria it is. I think we just need to know uh, how to treat it the best. And usually the best analogy I use with patients is, and it doesn't apply to Rich, if you're brushing your hair and you have blood on your hairbrush, is that normal? And every patient goes, no, that's not. I said, then why do we accept blood on our toothbrush as a normal thing? It's not a good sign. So we, if we take better care, and you know, sometimes you get patients say, well, it only it bleeds when I brush it, so I just don't brush it. I go, well, that's not the answer. The answer is you got to brush it more to get the healthy and healthier, and then it'll stop bleeding. But you know, people avoid going to the dentist because if it doesn't hurt, they ignore it. And we have to educate patients that you know, you really, if you catch these things early, it's less expensive and less traumatic. Okay, thank you. Moving right along, the next question here. Um, what do you see as most effective for patient self-care of deep pockets? I think the trays really make a big difference. I, I think that, as I said, I think if they use oral irrigators, uh, flossing, toothbrushing, they really can't get down into these uh, deep pockets. And these are the patients basically that, you know, they come in and you don't see any plaque on their teeth. You know they're brushing and taking care of it, but they're still getting bleeding and sometimes exudate in these pockets. They just can't reach down there. And I think that the trays make a difference because it's easy compliance. It gets the stuff down there, and it really gets rid of uh, the biofilm, which is causing a lot of the problems. Okay. Um, going back to the uh, toothbrush there, uh, we had a follow-up question. So no change in efficacy between manual and electric toothbrushes? Um, I think, it's just a matter of patient compliance? I think that uh, uh, electric toothbrushes are mu uh, much more effective than hand brushing. Okay. I think that the that bristles, uh, the vibration there, and get the bristles between the teeth and into the pocket better than uh, using a manual toothbrush. The problem is most people don't know how to use a manual toothbrush, so they're not really effective. Where I think if you, it's easier to use an electric toothbrush and be more efficient with it. So I think you do a better job. Okay, thank you. Uh, keep submitting those questions. We've got another one here. Um, is there any ongoing effort into developing new antibiotics that will have greater efficacy or fewer side effects? See, the problem with antibiotics, and it's interesting, the uh, uh, vancomycin used to be the, the go-to drug. And they basically, if another antibiotic didn't cure something, they take out vancomycin. And they started seeing, and it was overused, unfortunately, with ear infections. They started seeing probably 15 years or so ago, more and more cases of resistant bacteria to that. So I have a friend who's a cardiac nurse, and we're talking, she goes, oh, we have this new antibiotic, and it's, you take one pill and that's it. It's $1,000, I'm like, $1,000? She goes, it can't cost that much to make. She goes, no, they don't want people to use this first line because they're trying to delay resistance to these. And if it was less expensive, they, people would write, uh, prescribe it more, and we'd build up resistance. So I think that, we're overusing antibiotics in a lot of ways, and that's why we're building up resistance. And I think the answer a lot of times is doctors just, and you know, we're, we do it too, but I think the physicians do it more. They throw antibiotic prescriptions at patients uh, for the least thing, and I think that's not always the, uh, the best solution. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next question here. Uh, tell us, Dr. Kurtzman, if you think the formality of the periodontal tray improves compliance by the patient, 
and what percentage of periodontal disease are you prescribing them? I usually, uh, I, I tend to recommend it for, uh, if, what I'll do basically, it depends. If I see a patient has uh, deep pocketing and bleeding, I'll recommend it from the start. If I have somebody else that comes in and we have subgenual calculus and we clean it out, and they come back for the second visit, and I see that the first two quadrants look great, the inflammation's gone, and they're not really not getting any bleeding when I test it, I probably won't. It really depends on patient compliance, but if they come back and it's still bleeding, and it's just not, they're not doing a great job, or those patients that really just don't do good with home care, I think the tray helps overcome some of those issues. Okay, great, thank you. We do have a few more minutes here, so keep those questions coming into the uh, chat tool here in the uh, lower right-hand corner. Um, the next question reads, you spoke of converting hard calculus to something less tenacious. Can you clarify or explain that further? Well, basically peroxide breaks it down so it softens the calculus so it's easier to get off. So you get those patients that come in and they're like totally encased in uh, calculus. You can see it on the x-ray, you can probe it. Uh, those patients may be a candidate to use the trays with the peroxide prior to using uh, scaling or replanning, so it'll soften it and break it down, be easier for you to remove mechanically. There's nothing else besides peroxide that'll do that at this point. Okay, great, thank you. And we have one more question here. Um, given all these factors limiting the effectiveness of biofilm removal, what is your approach for removal of biofilm in deep pockets? What is your go-to regimen? Uh, what I'll usually do is we'll uh, anesthetize the patient, go in and mechanically scale and root plane using piezo. Uh, we'll go in and make sure that we've gotten all that out, and then we use the laser in conjunction with that. Uh, only when I see deep pocketing, I'll use the laser in those areas. Uh, basically, just to get rid of that necrotic tissue in the pocket so it'll heal on its own. The uh, wavelength tends to stimulate uh, healing in the soft tissue, uh, so we see an improvement there. And then what we'll do is we'll put them into uh, the perio protect trays, and I like to see them probably two to three weeks after we finish scaling or replaning, they've been using this, just to make sure they're using it, everything is uh, healing. We see an isolated area, we may anesthetize and go in and retreat that scale. Maybe we missed a little bit of calculus in there that we couldn't see. Treat it again with the laser, and then basically put them on recall. Um, it, depending on if it's a severe case, I may see them two months later just to check everything, and then we get them onto three month recall. Okay, thank you. And we did get one more question in here. Um, what is your approach with trays if the patient doesn't have coverage? I usually, I tell the patient uh, it's a small investment. It, it, we're talking $700. I don't think it's an enormous amount of money. Uh, it's really, it, doing grafting and flap surgery is gonna cost a lot more, and it's gonna be a lot more painful, and that's not gonna help maintain it over time. It's really a small investment. You know, you say, well, if you take care of the trays, they'll last you a couple of years. I think it's real, and most of the patients, when you convince them, tell them this, they say, well, yeah, they agree. It's, it's really a small investment uh, in maintaining this. I mean, of course, you're going to get some patients who don't want to spend money on anything, uh, but I think most patients, when you explain it and say this is inexpensive maintenance versus what it could be, or losing teeth and then having to wear, pay for dentures or wear dentures or implants, uh, this is really a low-cost uh, maintenance uh, thing, even if insurance doesn't cover it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions I see at the, uh, for now, so any closing remarks before we go? Uh, anybody who has a question on anything in dentistry, um, they can feel free to uh, email me uh, or they can find me on Facebook um, and I'll more than happy to answer anything. If you do have a case question, it really uh, helps if you send the x-rays with it. Uh, if you have pictures, that's great, but x-rays are really important. Uh, it's like somebody sent me a, a case today from India. What do I do with this? Sends me a nice photograph of a broken tooth. He goes, can I put an implant here? I go. I, I need an x-ray to see what's going on. So if you send me x-rays, it's easier, uh, and I'm more than happy to uh, help answer questions or help you work through cases. So just drop me an email, and I'm there for you. All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention tonight and for Sunstar for sponsoring our session. We are going to close with a quick survey, and 
We please provide your feedback before you leave the session. Uh, thank you so much for your participation throughout the series and have a great evening. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Everybody.